Hello everyone, I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to the Audio Analyst. Pardon me. This week, I want to demystify and explain the difference between the two types of interfaces we use to connect our audio systems. Unbalanced, or single-ended, and balanced interconnect cables. To understand what they mean, and why or why not to use one or the other, we'll start by revisiting amplifier fundamentals as presented in episode 19 here on the channel. Now, first, for clarity, unbalanced and single-ended may be considered synonymous in today's discussion. So, whichever one I use, it means the same thing. Now, all UEEs, and particularly tech-savvy uh, viewers out there, please understand that for the purposes of today's discussion, to promote clarity and uh, overall understanding, all topics under, under discussion today will have their scope limited to their use and application in two-channel high-performance audio systems. Now, as outlined in episode 19, all amplifiers fall into one of two basic circuit implementations, which are characterized by how they treat signals and grounds. Amplifiers will be either single-ended, like pure Class A amplifiers, or differential designs of the push-pull variety, like pure Class B or Class AB, the operational class more commonly used uh, for high-performance audio amplification. Now, in a single-ended or pure Class A amplifier, one device, uh, a tube or a transistor, or a group of similar devices working together as a single unit is used to amplify and reproduce the entire output waveform. In such a circuit design, we usually have two important voltage references, the varying signal itself and ground. The term balanced amplifier is really something of a misnomer. Um, balanced and unbalanced are types of connection interfaces between devices. These terms mean nothing in regard to the specific amplifier architectures. Usually, when you see the, the, the expression balanced amplifier, it is being used to refer to a differential amplifier, one without shared grounds and offering balanced outputs. But building a truly balanced and differential signal path from source to load requires twice the circuitry and is sometimes referred to as dual mono to indicate that each channel is completely isolated from the other. Now, while this means it is more expensive to manufacture, it can also yield clearly audible improvements, and we'll get into that. With the differential or push-pull amplifier, two separate devices, tubes or transistors, or groups of similar devices working together as complementary pairs are employed. With this particular circuit architecture, the signal crests are amplified by one device or set of devices, while the signal troughs are amplified by a second device or set of devices. In essence, resulting in uh, each complement reproducing the opposite phases of the complete signal. With push-pull or differential amplifiers, balance is defined in terms of the impedance of the two signal conductors with respect to a reference, which is commonly ground. If these impedances are equal and not zero, then the system is considered balanced. If the impedances are unequal, then the system is unbalanced. That makes sense, right? Now, one of the more important and interesting points in our discussion is that a differential amplifier will only care about the difference between those two phases. So distortions and nonlinearities like power supply ripple, AC potential differences between chassis, and other uh, interferences, 
tend to be canceled once the phases are recombined at their destination. The phases, positive and negative, referred to as hot and cold, are the two important voltage references for differential amplification. Now, just as we may state that amplifiers are either single-ended or differential, we may similarly state that the connections used between audio components are either unbalanced or balanced. An unbalanced cable uses only two conductors to transfer the signal from one device to another, with one conductor carrying the signal and the other providing the grounded return. That means that Single-ended interconnects may use simple two-conductor terminations called RCA plugs, where balanced cables require the use of the more massive three-conductor uh, termination, the XLR plug. But where did these now standard connections come from, and, and just what do they mean? Well, the RCA phono plug was created by the Radio Corporation of America, from which it gets its name and was introduced in the 1930s. The male plug has a center pin 3.175 millimeter or an eighth of an inch in diameter, typically conducting the signal, and is surrounded by an outer shell, which is 8.25 millimeter or one third of an inch in diameter to provide ground. The female RCA jack uh, is constructed in a mirrored fashion to receive that connection. Now, created for use as an internal connector on RCA's own radio phonograph floor consoles, those amplifier chassis had female connector jacks which accepted the male plug terminated cables from the radio chassis and phono player. The concept was intended as an easy and effective way to disconnect the sources for troubleshooting the console when servicing was required. The biggest potential shortcoming with the single-ended interconnect is that because the grounds between both devices are linked, wayward currents from power supply transformer leakages or stray capacitance can become part of the audio signal. These currents can introduce undesirable audible hum or other interference in these unbalanced connections. In addition, the shared ground between unbalanced channels can generate crosstalk, which is essentially unwanted signal leakage or coupling between channels. Further, most single-ended cables use little, if any, shielding to reject radiated or induced noises. The XLR connector is a type of electrical connector that has been widely adapted for pro audio because of the design's greater inherent noise rejection, especially over the longer runs typically found in such applications, and is used for balanced audio interconnection, including the AES-3 standard for digital audio. The connectors are much more bulky and massive than the RCA standard, are of a barrel or cylindrical nature and design, incorporate a spring-loaded latching mechanism, and in most audio applications, have three pins on the male plug or three receiving ports on the female jack. The XLR connector was the design of James H. Cannon, founder of Cannon Electric, back in 1915 in Los Angeles, California, which is now a part of the uh, ITT Corporation. But originally, manufactured as the Cannon X connection, uh, a latching mechanism would added, was added in 1950, and a version that surrounds the and, and better insulates the female uh, contacts was developed in 1955. That final version adopted the part number prefix XLR, which is stuck as the connector's name. It is now commonly accepted to mean X for ground, L for left or hot, and R for right or cold. Now, if you've gleaned the significance of the use of the three conductor system to carry the two inverted halves of the signal and its grounded reference, pat yourself on the back. With a truly balanced interface between devices, pin one is used for the ground reference, pin two is used for the crests or hot signal, and pin three is used for the troughs or cold signal. Using a balanced connection eliminates the linking of the grounds between the two 
chassis of the two devices. Therefore, eliminating one of the biggest sources of hum and noise loops. It offers another big advantage too. Each phase has an equal impedance relative to ground, which is what the term balanced refers to. When the two signals are recombined in the input stage of the equipment being fed, they are recombined by subtraction, with the inverted signal being subtracted from the normal signal. Now, the result is to retrieve the original signal, yet at twice its strength. And this is the clever bit, to exactly cancel out any hum or noise picked up on the conductors and is referred to as common mode noise rejection. And as a result of that doubled signal strength is that fully balanced internal circuitry typically may yield another three decibels of dynamic range. Nice side benefit. Now, many Class A amplifiers offer XLR connections, even though they cannot offer balanced circuits. In such cases, users may opt for the use of XLR cables because most single-ended cables offer extraordinary little, if any, shielding. Using an XLR cable in such cases may offer greater rejection of electromagnetic interference, radio frequency interference, or other spurious noise. Another reason would be to connect a device uh, that only offers XLR connectivity. In such cases, this would save the expense and hassle of using an XLR to RCA adapter and the possible noise that may introduce to the system. In such amplifiers, though the balanced XLR cables used are identical, the pin configuration on the devices often chooses to have both pins one and three tied to ground, rather than just pin one, with pin two carrying the varying signal. It's not standard, or not mandatory, but it's common. Now, while single-ended amplifiers tend to use only unbalanced connections, and balanced outputs tend to be driven by differential amplifiers, these are not rules that are set in stone. Now, just what does that mean? Well, though amplifiers like my reference AudioNet Max monoblocks come equipped with both RCA and XLR inputs, the manufacturer recommends using the single-ended inputs. AudioNet, not unlike most other amplifier manufacturers today, uses an operational amplifier splitter to allow for a balanced input. And while the device that AudioNet has chosen to use for this purpose may be among the fastest and best sounding of such devices available today, it is nonetheless an unnecessary addition to the system's circuitry, one made exclusively to accept an XLR connection from a preamp, and is audibly different than the single-ended input. In fact, this classic version of the single op-amp balanced amplifier has been accepted and is used extensively throughout the industry. This application works particularly well in low source impedance configurations, especially like those encountered when bridging a stereo amplifier into mono mode. But this method can sacrifice punch in higher source impedance applications because of the varying input impedance of each input when referred to ground. In such cases, it has a, a seriously diminished ability to reject any injected or radiated noises negating the design's original purpose while also increasing signal path complexity. Again, if you've been reading between the lines, you will probably have picked up on the fact that there are situations where neither interface is clearly a better option than the other. Typically, when connecting a balanced DAC, phono stage, or other source to a differential line stage or preamp, or connecting that differential line stage or preamplifier to a differential stereo amplifier or pair of differential monoblocks, it may make the most sense to take advantage of the additional native noise suppression and rejection that a balanced XLR cable would afford. In cases where an op amp is used in a similar manner as that used in my reference monoblocks, 
A single-ended connection is preferred and a more accurate choice. Now, in general, it would make sense to use balanced XLR cables when both connected devices operate in true differential mode. When you are in an especially noisy RF or EMI environment, or when you need to use particularly long runs, say, more than 10 or 12 feet. So is the balanced interconnect a holy grail in high performance audio? Is it a, uh, a, an essential ingredient for top performing two channel systems? Unfortunately, things are not always as simple as they may appear on the surface. The problems lie both in the way the inverted part of the balanced signal pair is generated and the way that it's recombined. Both processes involve extra complications in the circuitry, and this can sometimes degrade the sound quality. Also, regardless of the exact method used to generate the balanced pair of signals and reconstruct the original afterward, the balancing will only extend up to a certain frequency limit. Beyond that limit, the signals will no longer be a mirror image of each other, and asymmetry sets in. This may well be at quite a high frequency, well above the audible range, yet it can still affect the final audible result. And obviously, if the balancing-unbalancing no longer works perfectly, Neither does the noise cancellation, which can break down at ultrasonic frequencies. In a lot of cases, where there are options for both connections, the balance may be clearly better, often sounding cleaner, purer, and more dynamic. Yet, as we've hit on, other equipment simply does not benefit from the use of a balanced connection, with the single end interface sounding better. It will depend on how well the extra circuitry has been implemented and whether those benefits outweigh any problems with the interference, ground loop noise, and hum from the single-ended connection. With sensible design, careful grounding arrangements, well-selected cable, combined with a low driving impedance, traditional single-ended connections can provide superb and almost totally noise-free performance. Which is best to use with your gear? I'd always start by checking with your manufacturer to see what they recommend, then use your own ears. With that, I'll remind you that if you find any merit or value in the information I'm sharing here, please subscribe, like, and share links to episodes with your friends. And I love hearing from you, so be sure to leave your comments and questions. You may support the channel using Patreon, Venmo, or PayPal or even by securing display advertising at the Audio Analyst website. And links for all options are provided in today's description section. As always, thank you so very much for taking the time to drop by and visit today. Please stay safe and keep the music playing. Till next week, cheers.